the transcript summary of the telephone conversation between Trump and Zelensky. It's the perfect political Warshak test. It literally is ink on a paper. People see what they see and don't understand how other people don't see the same thing. <laughs> So this whole Trump impeachment inquiry, whistleblower complaint, it's the vlog that keeps on vlogging. It's an ever-changing story with many moving parts, and every day there seems to be another interesting point in law that is being brought up by this entire saga. In a previous vlog, I did a breakdown of the whistleblower complaint. It wasn't intended to be an exhaustive explanation of the situation. There are too many elements of this story to cover in one video. So I figured I would just walk through the whistleblower complaint, shed my legal insight into the document itself so that everybody else could have a better understanding going forward and reading the news on their own. And a lot of people took issue with my qualification of the whistleblower complaint as hearsay, but my qualification of the whistleblower complaint as hearsay was not intended to undermine, discredit, or otherwise exclude the whistleblower complaint in and of itself. The whistleblower complaint is partly based on hearsay. It's in fact based on double hearsay at some points. It's based on news articles, and there are certain elements of first-hand knowledge in the whistleblower complaint. And it is true that certain aspects of the hearsay portions of the whistleblower complaint were partly confirmed by certain excerpts of the trump Zelensky telephone conversation. And so a lot of people were asking me to walk through the transcript of the telephone conversation and shed my insight, if I have any, into the substance of that transcript. But this entire saga is a big machine with many moving parts and many spinning wheels. And each wheel, metaphorically speaking, can itself be a separate vlog. Let's start with the issue of hearsay itself. What is it? We don't need to get into a doctorate thesis breakdown of what hearsay is. Incidentally, if you want a very thorough breakdown explanation as to what hearsay is under US law, I'll link to Legal Eagle's video right here. He does a great job explaining what hearsay is and what the exceptions to hearsay are under American law. I can't vet for the accuracy of the information in that video. I am not a US attorney. I am only a Quebec attorney, but it looked and sounded pretty accurate, especially given the comparisons to Canadian law. And simply put, hearsay is a report of another person's words put forward by a specific witness who does not have first-hand knowledge of the information of that statement itself. I don't know if that's actually simply put. All right, more simply put, hearsay is one witness saying what someone else told them in order to evidence the truthfulness of that statement. And hearsay evidence is generally inadmissible as evidence. Let's take a concrete example. I have Jack on the stand. I say, Jack, how do you know Jill hit your car? And he says, well, Steve, my neighbor, told me that he saw Jill hit my car. That is hearsay because Jack did not see Jill hit his car. Jack is relaying to the court a statement relayed to him by Steve to the effect that Steve saw Jill hit Jack's car. And generally speaking, it's inadmissible. Why? Because nobody gets to cross-examine Steve on what Steve allegedly saw. You want to put in evidence that Steve saw Jill hit Jack's car? Call Steve as a witness. Call Steve as a witness. All right, first parentheses of this video. One trick that lawyers try to use to circumvent the general rule of inadmissibility of hearsay evidence, they'll say something to the effect that, I'm not trying to prove that it's true that Jill struck Jack's car. I just want to prove that it's true that Steve told Jack that he said he saw Jill hit Jack's car. They say something to the effect that, I don't want to prove that the statement is true, I just want to prove that the statement was made to the witness. Knowing darn well that if that line of questioning is allowed, that it would be in the mind or head of the judge that somebody said they saw Jill strike Jack's car, even if Jack had no first-hand knowledge of it. And the majority of the time, a judge will maintain an objection to the admissibility of that evidence. They'll say, call Steve if you want that information in the file. I don't care if Steve said it to Jack, call Steve if you want to ask any questions on what Steve said. Back to the video. And this plays into the rules of best evidence. The best evidence that Steve saw Jill hit Jack's car is Steve testifying to the fact that he saw Jill hit Jack's car so he can be cross-examined by the opposing counsel. And so hearsay evidence is generally inadmissible except under certain exceptions, one of which is necessity. So let's just say hypothetically Steve died before trial. Now Jack can no longer call Steve as a witness to testify to the effect that he saw Jill hit Jack's car. So under those circumstances, given the necessity of the situation, the hearsay evidence might be admissible. It might be admissible, but its probative value is going to be severely compromised. Its probative value, meaning the amount of weight the court is going to give to that type of evidence, is going to be less than had it been Steve testifying firsthand. And so when discussing hearsay, we have to make a distinction between admissibility and probative value. And when I was breaking down the whistleblower complaint and remarking that quite a bit of it was actually hearsay, some of it was even double hearsay, and I dare say some of it was even triple hearsay, in that it was double hearsay as to the emotions of other people. The purpose wasn't to deny the admissibility or the validity of the whistleblower complaint in and of itself. It was just to sensitize people 
people to the probative value of the evidence alleged therein. And although some of the evidence was in fact corroborated to some extent by the transcript summary of the telephone conversation between Trump and Zelensky, corroboration of certain elements of hearsay does not validate other elements of hearsay. But regardless, that is pleading the actual merits of the complaint itself, which is not the purpose of this video. So that's the hearsay part. Now moving on to the whistleblower complaint itself. In the days following my video, it became news that apparently the rules were changed shortly before, after, contemporaneously with the filing of the whistleblower complaint, and apparently the change to those rules allowed for hearsay evidence in whistleblower complaints. And so in a follow-up video to that initial breakdown of the whistleblower complaint, I brought up that piece of information and explained how it's interesting and could be interpreted one way or the other depending on how one views this entire situation. And since that follow-up video, because the news is an ever-evolving thing, it seems to be accepted news now that the law was never changed, the substantive rules were never changed, hearsay evidence was always allowed in support of a whistleblower complaint, but the form was changed, which made it clearer to people filing whistleblower complaints that they could rely on hearsay evidence. That is where that element of the news is now in its evolution, but it's irrelevant to the substance of this discussion. Whether or not the rules were changed, whether or not they were not in fact changed, whether or not hearsay evidence was always allowed, the purpose of the breakdown was not to invalidate the whistleblower complaint itself because of the hearsay. It was just to sensitize people to the probative value of the allegations within that whistleblower complaint to the extent that they were based on hearsay, double hearsay, triple hearsay, quadruple hearsay, who knows hearsay. All right, and just a 30,000 foot overview of the impeachment process so that we can sort of put things into context. The whistleblower complaint has now served as the basis for an impeachment inquiry by the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is going to determine by majority vote whether or not they pass a resolution listing the charges or articles of impeachment. And if the House of Representatives approves articles of impeachment, they then submit it to the Senate and the 100 members of the Senate serve as jury. And in order to convict and impeach a sitting president, the resolution, the articles of impeachment have to pass by a super majority of 67 votes on 100 senators on 100 senators all right, one more parenthesis because I realize I forgot to mention what constitutes grounds for impeachment. According to the US Constitution, the President of the United States, the Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States can be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Treason and bribery have generally accepted definitions, but what is meant by high crimes and misdemeanors? The answer to that question is a vlog in and of itself and not something we're gonna get into in this video. Suffice to say that the President need not have committed an actual criminal offense in order to satisfy the high crimes and misdemeanors demeanors portion of the criteria for impeachment. It can refer to conduct that constitutes corruption or that is fundamentally incompatible with the office of the President of the United States of America. All right, back to the video. And that is the impeachment process in an absolute nutshell from 30,000 feet from a Canadian sitting on an Air Canada airplane. Canada airplane. All right, sorry, this is actually the last parentheses of this video. Cool fact that I learned while researching for this video, Andrew Johnson was in fact impeached because apparently the House was unhappy with the way he was dealing with certain post-Civil War issues, and he was acquitted by one vote and allowed to remain in office for the rest of his presidency. How cool is that? All right, now let's read the relevant sections of the transcript or memorandum of the telephone conversation itself. Full disclosure, I'm not reading the entire transcript. Incidentally, if you want a full readout of the transcript, I'll link a video right here. It is literally two people reading out the entire transcript of the Zelensky-Trump conversation. The first page of the transcript really is nothing more than two leaders of two nations flattering each other, stroking each other's egos, congratulating each other, etc., etc. One has to be polite in politics, after all. Where the political Warshak test that is this transcript begins is at page two. The president, well, it's very nice of you to say that. I will say that we do a lot for Ukraine. We spend a lot of effort and a lot of time, much more than European countries are doing, and they should be helping you more than they are. Germany does almost nothing for you. All they do is talk, and I think it's something that you should really ask them about. When I was speaking to Angela Merkel, she talks Ukraine, but she doesn't do anything. A lot of the European countries are the same way, so I think it's something you want to look at, but the United States has been very, very good to the Ukraine. I wouldn't say that it's reciprocal necessarily because things are happening that are not good, but the United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. President Zelensky. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Not only 100%, but actually 1000%. And I can tell you the following and talked with Macron and I told them that they are not doing quite as much as they need to be doing on the issues with the sanctions. They are not enforcing the sanctions. They are not working as much as they should work for Ukraine. It turns out that even though logically the European Union should be our biggest partner, but technically the United States is a much bigger partner than the European Union. And I'm very grateful to you for that because the United States is doing quite a lot for Ukraine, much more than the European 
Union, especially when we are talking about sanctions against the Russian Federation. I would also like to thank you for your great support in the area of defense. We are ready to continue to cooperate for the next steps. Specifically, we are almost ready to buy more javelins from the United States for defense purposes. First parentheses here, a lot of people have taken issue with the fact that the transcript for this telephone conversation was apparently placed on a more secure server. One that was encrypted and code worded, etc. And that is traditionally not done and therefore evidence to the fact that Trump and the administration knows that they did something wrong in this telephone conversation. And the explanation given by some who disagree with that interpretation is that there's talk about javelins purchasing military weapons and so it makes sense that there might be something in here that justifies increasing the security on the transcript for this particular telephone conversation. But this is where we get into the bulk of it. I would like you to to do us a favor though because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say CrowdStrike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, the server. They say Ukraine has it. There are a lot of things that went on the whole situation. I would like to have the Attorney General call you or your people and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. As you saw yesterday, the whole nonsense ended with a very poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller. An incompetent performance. But they say a lot of it started with Ukraine. Whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's possible. And there, to many, you have the quid to the pro quo, or the pro quo to the quid. However you want to put it, that's the quid pro quo right there. Discussion about aid in one paragraph, followed by I would like you to do us a favor in the other. And what's truly fascinating is seeing how everybody reads these black and white words, ink on paper, and interprets them totally differently. Some are saying that it's a clear quid pro quo. Others are saying that it's an implied quid pro quo. Others are saying it's not a quid pro quo at all. Two world leaders discussing, they're going to discuss numerous issues. It wasn't Trump saying, can you do me a favor? It was Trump saying, can you do us a favor? Some are going to read this and say that getting to the bottom of corruption ought to be in the national best interest and is not evidence of Donald Trump's personal interest. Others are going to say that this is an attempt to dig up dirt on a political rival and that the aid to the Ukraine was, if not held over the Ukraine's head, at the very least, strongly implied or suggested that it might be conditional on the help. And apparently the aid to the Ukraine was withheld, but apparently, according to many, it was not known to the Ukraine at this time that the aid was being withheld and is therefore tough to have a quid pro quo when someone doesn't know that the quid is being held over their head to the pro quo. Oh, and what is quid pro quo? It is Latin for something given or received in exchange for something else. But the very interesting thing is looking at this and seeing how both sides are going to build their argument. Those who support the impeachment say that this is a clear quid pro quo, and this is the President of the United States using his office as President of the United States in order to obtain dirt on a political rival, while others are going to say that this is the President of the United States using his position in order to fight corruption. And for those who don't believe that this constitutes a quid pro quo at all or any impeachable offense, they invoke a treaty between the United States and the Ukraine called the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, which requires each party to that treaty, being the Ukraine and the United States, to assist each other in ongoing criminal investigations. And those who believe that this was a quid pro quo impeachable offense argue that the treaty doesn't find application here because there was no active investigation going on that could justify invoking the treaty. The treaty. All right, there are a lot of interruptions to this video because there's a lot of information that has to go into this video. One part of the transcript of the telephone conversation that I did not actually read involved Rudolf Giuliani's role in this entire thing. Now, oh, for whatever the reason, and people are gonna disagree on the reason, Rudolf Giuliani was involved in dealings, discussions, meetings with Zelensky and or his people. And some people consider this to be evidence of Donald Trump acting for his personal interests to the extent that he has Rudolph Giuliani, his personal lawyer, arguably acting in some capacity for the White House. In my previous video, I did highlight why it might be understandable that the president has his personal attorney involved in these types of matters. Also, for those who are going to say that Rudolph Giuliani's presence doesn't indicate corruption at all, they will point to the fact that the point of contact is nonetheless Attorney General Barr and not Donald Trump's personal attorney. In any event, just specifying that so that no one thinks that by omitting Rudolph off Giuliani's presence in the transcript, I am somehow guilty of bias by omission. Back to the video, no more interruptions, the video is almost over. Stay focused, stay focused. Anyhow, it truly is a fascinating situation to understand and view from the perspective of two sides, each building their arguments and what they're going to invoke in order to present their position and counter the position of the other. It's also an amazing example of how two people can look at the same thing and see something totally different. Rashomon. And just to end this video on one more example of the Rashomon Warshak test, I'm going to read one text which both parties are going to use to support their positions. And this is a text between Bill Taylor and Gordon Sondland, two US diplomats discussing this Ukrainian aid business. And the texts read as follows. September 9th, 2019, 1247 AM. Bill Taylor. As I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. September 9th, 2019, 539 AM. Bill, I believe you are incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The President 
president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. The president is trying to evaluate whether Ukraine is truly going to adopt the transparency and reforms that President Zelensky promised during his campaign. If you still have concerns, I recommend you give Lisa Kenna or S a call to discuss them directly. Thanks. Bill Taylor, I agree. And how is this text going to be interpreted? Those in support of impeachment are going to argue that this is evidence of the quid pro quo. Even a U.S. diplomat was saying that it's improper to do. The other side is going to say, absolutely not. This is evidence to the contrary. This is evidence to the fact that there was no quid pro quo. This was just the president trying to ensure that the monies, the $400 million going to the Ukraine, was going to be used for the intended purposes and not going to get absorbed by a corrupt political machine. Some are going to look at the fact that multiple hours lapsed between the initial text and the response to say, look at that. They're panicking. They have to figure out a response to cover their tushies. The other side is going to argue, who knows what happened during that five hours? Maybe the other party was in a meeting and just couldn't respond. Or they're going to say it was such a lack of urgency. There was no rush to get back to it. There was no rush to get back to it. Oh, and also they're going to say that Bill Taylor ultimately agreed with the previous statement, meaning that he acknowledged that there was no quid pro quo and that he was mistaken in his understanding of the situation. All right, and that is both sides of the situation. If you like my videos and you like my content, be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share my channel with someone. It'll help me grow. If you want some merch, I do have the Vlog Dog shirts. I'll put a link in the comment section below. And now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah!